Okay, so we're going to get right into it. The Cavs lose to the Kings and ugly fet. No, we're, we're going to avoid that. Uh, hey, Pete, we may have to just start doing Cavs stuff soon here, you know, depending on uh -huh. how the season plays out. <laughs> well, they had their opportunity. They had a week of just themselves and they blew it. I mean, well, obviously. they also were playing at 10 p.m. at night, so nobody got to see them blow it. I mean, I didn't stay up well, for that. Well, I'm willing to bet that the, the Cavs were in good shape in both of the games they've lost until Abby fell asleep. I'm guaranteeing <laughs> that's what happened. It's Abby's fault for sure. Pretty much. Uh, anyway, the Browns are on the bye week uh, and getting ready to play the Miami Dolphins. Needless to say, going out on the win they had against the Bengals has been a huge blessing for this team because you haven't heard a whole lot of just – People just being super down on this team. People are relatively excited, including the players. You know, you if you've listened to some of the talk this week from players, that, you know, like Amari Cooper and Jacoby Brissett saying, no, we feel really good. We're excited to get back to work um, because they felt like they had something really going offensive, defense, and special needs. Obviously, coming off the best win of their season, that's natural. But I think it's been good for the overall mood of the of the region in some ways that life is better when the Browns are, you know, playing well or playing well enough or at least not losing because it's the bye week. So Browns have played eight games. Uh, obviously, we're not happy with all of them. But talking some big picture stuff, looking at the offensive side of the ball, what have we learned through eight weeks of this team with everything, all things considered, Jacoby Brissett at quarterback, uh, Deshaun Watson currently on his suspension, which has gone pretty s swiftly as far as I'm It feels yeah. like it, it time is flies, not, Pete. Time flies. It goes quick. Well, look, and, and part of that, we'll get into this. The fact that Jacoby Brissett has played well enough. If he stunk out the joint, I think this that that time would have just dragged. But the fact that he's played as well as he has um, has, has been good. So where are we at offensively? Well, I have one very important question before I answer this question. We went on our own like mini buy because we're recording this much later in the week. But I have to know, like we needed to make some adjustments on the podcast. And one of the biggest requests was that I didn't even really think about was, do we have outro music, Pete? Is uh, this our debut we, outro music? Allegedly, we do. Well, <laughs> this this well, this occurred for two reasons. One, the <laughs> podcast is ending everyone abruptly. What happened. The podcast ends abruptly, I guess had been, but on top of that, when I went to close, like stop recording, I just closed out the whole meeting. So yeah, I he hung, hung, he hung up, up on me. me. So like, really, there wasn't much we could do there. It was no, just, it was a I feel really bad about this. And your whole worry is just, I hope we got the podcast. <laughs> and I was I like, I'm wanna... exhausted. I can't do this again. So, so please tell me it's safe. Um, my understanding from, from Adam, producer Adam is that he is going to this episode should have outro music. So, you know, we do appreciate people who provide feedback and are just the podcast apparently just stops and they're not. Hey, sure listen, I was brief, just impressed. We had so many people that listened to the very end. I am not a podcast person that listens to the final, like last thought. I'm always like mm, these last five minutes. Do they really mean that much? So, hey, thank you for listening all the way through to realize that our podcast just abruptly ends. Yeah, I'm I'm sort of the other way, but that's because I'm like a, a person. I'm not a person who can do 1.5. I can't can't do it that fast. But 1.2, 1.3 speed, I can do that. But uh, yeah, I don't usually check out early on stuff if for no other reason. I just like it to naturally delete off my phone. But uh, yeah, I, I you know I, I don't know where people come out on that. But yeah, it is it is nice to hear that. Um, it, it certainly would be easy to like check in and be like, I don't like this and move on. <laughs> So that is that is nice. Anyway. OK, so so I guess I'll answer your question. What, what was it again? Something about the offense. What have we learned about the offense through eight weeks, eight games? OK, well, I think what I have learned is that Kevin Stefanski is a really good offensive coach and play caller. And, um, you know, I think he's done really well with Jacoby Brissett and getting as much out of him as he possibly can. Um, Jacoby has really exceeded expectations uh, up until this point. There's obviously been those timely mistakes, and I'm sure he would like to have some of those moments back that were very costly in some of these games. But yeah, at the end of the day, like Jacoby's been, I think, even better than any of us could have imagined. Unfortunately, the record doesn't necessarily support that um which is unfortunate i think for all of us and and i think we'd all like to have some of those games back 
But uh, when you look at just the offense overall, what are we what are we ranked, Pete? Now I'm, I don't actually know. We're, we're still in the top ten, right? Last I saw, we're sixth ranked by DVOA. If you go just by rankings on, on PFF, we're number one. Um, I say we, you know, we're on the team. <laughs> yeah, but for sure, um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, like, there's a couple things that I take away, and, and you're 100 percent right with Jacoby Brissett. Like thinking about it, and I did a podcast with with Jeff Lloyd this week and and on there I mentioned the fact mere, mere fact of going into the season there were a whole lot of people saying we have to trade for Jimmy Garoppolo we or Gardner Minshew or mm-hmm. you know s- coax Philip Rivers out of retirement or raise Otto Graham from Drew the Drew Brees was also another one yeah <laughs> like any number of these things and eight games into the year Jacoby Brissett is not a great quarterback but he has done Absolutely everything we could have asked in terms of eliminating that as a conversation. Obviously, look, the 49ers situation took its own turn and, you know, it it, it took itself off the table. But I don't think anyone is going back and going, well, you know, this would be a whole different story with with Jimmy Garoppolo. I think Jacoby Brissett has acquitted himself well enough to sort of eliminate that as a potential criticism of this team. And I think that is a big, big deal. Look, I, I never thought that was realistic, the money involved and everything else. But take that out of the equation. I think Jacob Brissett has played well enough to be able to just say, look, I played well enough. And he is a guy who at least sounds like is going to see what's out there. And if somebody's going to offer him a starting job, he's going to take it. And I, I don't love his chances there. I frankly think he's more likely to come back, but we'll see. The other thing that was a huge boost for this team was the acquisition of Omari Cooper. And he's been everything we hoped it would be and more. And that's a bigger deal than, than people want to admit because, you know, God bless all the things people loved about Jarvis Landry and Odell Beckham. He is better than they were for this team. And you can make any number of, you can say any number of things about this, that, and the other, you know, if you want to blame Baker Mayfield for that, if you want to blame, you know, the offense for that and their love of tight ends, whatever, Amari Cooper's here. He fits great. And he's a dynamic playmaker every week. Like, yep. and you could not say that about those guys. And like, we all sat there wishing every week that Odell Beckham was going to suddenly be great. Like he had that Cowboys game where he had the three touchdowns. You said, yep. man, it's finally here. And Amari Cooper hasn't scored three touchdowns in the game, but he usually gets pretty close to a hundred yards and, and, a, you know, a touchdown, yep. a lot of these games. So you're sitting there going, that was a sigh of relief because this beyond Jarvis Landry and Odell Beckham, you go back to Dwayne Bow, you go to Josh Gordon. Yep. You know, they have not had that. That is a position that has absolutely just flustered them endlessly. And Amari Cooper has been great. Meanwhile, you look at the Dallas Cowboys and they're talking about signing none other than Odell Beckham because yep. they wish they had Amari Cooper back. So that part's been great. Donovan Peoples Jones, I, you know, I love what he's doing this year. I also love the fact he's making like maybe a little under a million dollars. I think he's gotten a lot better. I think he's found a great niche Um, as being a third guy. I think having Amari Cooper and David Njoku sort of ahead of him is like the perfect situation for him, but he's a nice player, you know, and, and getting a little bit of ahead of ourselves. Is he a guy where you just sit there and go, I want to extend him for $10 million a year. I I don't know about that, but I love what I'm seeing from him. Mm -hmm. He's another guy who fits really, really well. D- David Njoku is the guy we hoped he would be this year. And, you know, he looks to be on track to play this week, um, coming off the high ankle sprain, and he's been out- outstanding. So all of those things have taken what the Browns already do well with Nick Chubb and the offensive line and really given them a complete offense. And, look, that makes Jacoby Brissett better. There's no getting around that. Jacoby Brissett – is playing the best football of his career. He's also in the best situation of his career. And that's not to take anything away from him. That is what the Browns want to do. Andrew Barry has been preaching this since he got here is not only is it about the quarterback, but it's about maximizing the quarterback. And they've been able to do that so far. And you mentioned Kevin Stefanski with the, the playoff here with Baker Mayfield, him playing, it's a weird comparison. People are like, well, he played better with the torn labrum than he played this year. I I don't really like that as a comparison, but if if you're into that, fine. More importantly, you go from 2020 Mayfield to now 22 uh, Brissett, and both guys are succeeding. Like, it is year three. It is not a fluke 
at this point. Teams have had endless amount of time to prepare, prepare for this, including within the division, who've seen him numerous times, and he's just – they are good at this. It is not going to be like – Deshaun Watson in a month shows up and all of a sudden, you know, this offense is going to work anymore. Like they are good at this. So that's important. Uh, so I think those are all valid takeaways uh, in that vein, nine, uh, nine games to go. Six of them are on the road. The schedule has worked out very strangely this year on that front. What do we want to see going f- for the rest of this year? Oh, that feels like a loaded question, Pete. It is. <laughs> oh man. I, I don't know. I feel like, we as fans are holding on to any ounce of hope for playoffs. I think for me personally, it's going to be a very, very tough road um, in order to get to the playoffs, just based on who is on our schedule, who we have at quarterback for some of those matchups. Um, And, you know, when Deshaun comes back, I know this offense has been performing really well and you have to assume that it's obviously a very big upgrade at that position. However, he hasn't played in a very long time. He he gets to start practicing on Monday. He does. Right? That's a yeah, that's and, an important part of this. Yeah, and so I'm I'm not sure like what their plan is on how they're going to handle that. And in fact, I don't know if they answer that in any of the press conferences because you obviously still have Jacoby Brissett as the starting quarterback for the next three games. So very important considering he's going to be playing against the Dolphins, the Bills, mm-hmm. and then who's the other one? Uh, they played Tampa Bay. That, that's one of their remaining Oh, Tom Brady, that's right. Tampa Bay. So, you know, I, I think there's just a lot of things to weigh here. For me, I guess I just want to see this team continue to build upon their win against Cincinnati. And, uh, you know, I want them to compete, compete in the division particularly. Um, I think we had, obviously, a little bit of a letdown against the Ravens. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I want us to be competitive within the division, Anything can happen. We know that. Like there's injuries, uh, things unexpectedly occur that could swing things one way or the other. I want to see this team be competitive. I want to build upon the hope and what was a very strong win against Cincinnati. And I want to see this team get better. Same thing goes from the defensive side of the ball, too. I think the last couple of weeks with the defense, we started to see things maybe build a little bit more uh, and come together and gel. So I hope that they can pull that together. Um, heading into these next few games. And then obviously when Deshaun comes back, you know, I don't really know what to expect, to be honest with you. Um, I guess I just want to see what this team could look like um, and how Kevin Stefanski is going to operate this offense with a quarterback that he specifically wanted, right? Because with Mm -hmm. both Baker Mayfield and Jacoby Brissett, you know, this regimen, I don't think ever saw Baker as a future. That was obviously very clear. So, well, um, I, I <laughs> it's it, well, look, look, here's what I would say Kevin Stefanski went for this job twice. I think Baker yeah. Mayfield was a big part of that. Now, things change, right? But I think initially, right. look, the same thing Josh McDaniels wanted this job pretty badly. Yeah. Or a but- lot of people really liked Baker Mayfield and then have sort of like, that's, you know, he has not played with injuries and, and not playing well. Yeah. You, you and I think, on. I think there were some clear limitations just based on like, it almost felt like that 2020 season was like, everything has to go perfect. Um, which, you know, is, is not, it's not possible in the NFL. Like you, you can't have everything go perfectly in place in order for, for your team to win. Right. Like the really good teams can have some things not fall their way and still figure out a way to win. And obviously that's, that's in part due to having a really, really good quarterback that can make things happen. Um, but anyway, I think going back to Kevin Stefanski, like I, I am interested to see how he handles, you know, having this quarterback that he and Andrew Barry and, you know, Jimmy Haslam uh, desperately chased after, right? Like there, there was mm-hmm. the meeting in Houston where they were going over film and talking about what they could do. And um, so I, I am anxious to see like what is going to happen from that front. If we do see that this offense get even better um, with the quarterback change coming through and and honestly, just how the team just reacts overall uh, to this change, because you know, like what type of leader is he going to be? Um, How is this team going to deal with the adversity? Because it's not like it's going to be easy Going to away games, you're going to have the animosity from the other fan bases. No idea how the home base is going to react to to the situation and him starting. Um, You know, there's a lot of adversity that comes with all of this. And and how do we 
see that play out and how does this team respond to all of that? So it's, it's honestly, I don't think we're going to have anything in terms of lack of entertainment, regardless of winning or losing this final, this final um, part of the season. So let me, let me break down what I think they're going to do with Deshaun Watson in the next couple of weeks. And yeah. Let me see what you think based on that. So as you mentioned, he's going to be in practice Monday. He's going to be able to do individual drills. Fine. That's pretty normal stuff. What I expect to happen is he's going to be Josh Allen next week. He's going mm. to be, the, he's going to be the scout team quarterback. And if he gets reps with the offense, it's going to be practically none for the reason you stated they are trying to win this game. Right. I don't know how many, how many reps Josh Dobbs gets in a given practice. Like they don't really have the ability to just be like, yeah, well, you know, here's 10 plays for Deshaun Watson or five plays or whatever. It's like, and it's, I don't know how productive that is anyway. Like they, they want to win those games. They want to compete and the players want to compete. I don't think the players want to go out there as much as they may be excited for Watson and be like, have this sort of distorted attention to, to what's going on. What's important. The game this week needs to be important, not necessarily the game in a couple of weeks. Well, so I and think just, that's to, part of it. just to pause you there, Pete too. Obviously they know that they have Jacoby Brissett for the next three games, regardless during training camp. It was really weird because things were being split between Jacoby and Deshaun because no one knew at that point really how, when they were going to have Deshaun, right? Like it it was like a weird situation where like who was getting first team reps and like how that whole thing played out. And I do think that like, because they didn't know, like did some of that kind of spill into, you know, Jacoby obviously playing a lot more games than they had anticipated and him not maybe getting enough reps with the first team. I don't know. I mean, maybe that's reading too much into things, but no, I mean, that's, that is so much of what goes into uh, organizing and, and, and scheduling our practice is reps and who gets them and, and what are you trying to do and all those things. So, as I said, I think he's going to be the scout team quarterback for two weeks. I think that is going to be his way of getting acclimated. It's going to essentially be a mini training camp for him. It's going to be the hardest look he's most difficult look he's ever had in his career. Not because he hasn't gone against number one defenses in practice, but because he's going to be with the scout team offense against the number one defense in practice. Yep. And I think that may be a way to sort of get him, com- get him sort of up to speed faster. It's going to be difficult for him. That said, not being able to have Deshaun Watson play for you becomes a real luxury in terms of getting you ready for these two next, those two opponents. So, you know, Josh Dobbs or the other dude whose name escapes me that nobody even asked about at the uh, Andrew Berry press conference, which I was fascinated by. They can't give you the look that Deshaun gives you. It's going to make your defense better to have to prepare against Deshaun Watson. Even if he's, you know, not quite, you know, at the peak of his powers, he's still going to give you the best look possible. And then he's going to be Tom Brady the next week. Now, you know, I I, I don't imagine they're going to ask him to just be, you have to operate from the pocket, but maybe they do. And that's a way to sort of get him to, to do those things. Either way, he's going to have to make reads. He's going to have to make throws. That's going to get him acclimated. Maybe they beat him up a little bit. I know there are a lot of people who are worried about that. I, I'm only worried about the speed of the game and him making throws and all that stuff to get him ready. Then that next week, you know, when he's preparing for Houston on the road, he's going to get the full week of yeah. practice with the number one. So if you look from that view, you get three weeks of what I think could be very productive practice. Now that doesn't address potential chemistry issues with your, with the receivers. I think some of that, they're kind of hoping that they take care of on their own though. If you're the team and you, uh, you look, you take a situation like David Njoku. I don't know how much you want him really going extra as he's recovering right. from a high ankle sprain, or you know the normal uh, bumps and bruises that come with with that. But they may be sort of counting on that to happen at, outside of practice rather than trying to do it in in practice. So I, I do think that will be a way to get Deshaun Watson prepared. He, it, he, he, not going to be, you know, peak Deshaun Watson coming right up. He doesn't need to be. He just needs to take what Jacoby Brissett is doing. And if he just does that with a little bit extra, they're going to be fine against the Houston Texans. What I cannot project or guess or anything else is how he reacts to 60,000 fans hating him. Yeah, I know. And the when I when I thought about when I think about this, I go back to LeBron 
<laughs> and when he signed with the Miami Heat. And like initially he was like, this is going to be fun. I'm going to be the black hat. You mm-hmm. know, I've got Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh. We're going to have a lot of fun. It didn't take very long for him to start really hating that and really getting worn out for it. And obviously part of the reason, you know, there were a lot of reasons he he ultimately came back to Cleveland, not the least of which was a, a good opportunity to win a championship. But I think he really desperately wanted to be loved again. And there are guys who just can't be the villain. And in LeBron's case, it was just because he signed somewhere else. And yeah, it sort exactly. of looked stu- you know, he sort of looked childish in the way he did it. He did he wasn't accused of sexual misconduct by any number of, you know, countless women right. that make all these people like have a genuine, it's not even like for fun, we don't like you. It is potentially 60,000 fans seething with hatred for you. I don't know how you practice for that. I don't know how you prepare your, for, your, yourself for that. And Deshaun Watson has never had to deal with anything like that. You know, you go back to Clemson, you go back to his time with Houston Texans. He was always loved. Right. And that's, you know, maybe he's built like that. I mean, I hate Ben Roethlisberger, but credit to him. He could do that. He could function in that environment and sort of thrive on it in part because he's kind of a dick, a dick. But, you know, that's that's kind of how it goes. So I don't yeah. that's the part I don't get. Uh, the, I don't I don't know. We can't know. I don't think he even could possibly guess until it happens. But based on what I just told you in terms of preparation, does that make you feel better or does that make you sort of still where you were before? No, I mean, that makes total sense to me. And like I said, I I really like don't have a ton of expectations for this last stretch just in general, because like I said, I, I think it's going to be a really tough road to make the playoffs. They're going to have to win some games. They're not expected to win, maybe upset some teams. And, you know, I guess it could happen. But that's why I'm just saying, like, I, I think... I just want to see this team improve upon what they've been doing well, see some momentum continue forward. I I don't want to see those just complete meltdown moments that lose you a football game when you should be winning a football game. Like Mm -hmm. I hope that that is behind us and that is something that we don't have to continue to be disappointed about out coming out of this bye week. Like what adjustments were they able to make? Were they able to get better? Is this team still bought in, um, obviously, with this record. You know, I don't know. Like, th- this team we've seen really kind of just pack it in and make it through the rest of the season and not give full effort. So I- I'm really hoping that, that that's not what we see. I don't think we will. I'm just saying, like, we're just used to to seeing that when when a team kind of doesn't have anything left to play for. And, and you know, there's... There's no draft picks to play for either. So like it's also, you know, you're you're not in a position where losing does anything for you at this point. Right. Um, the only thing I would add to things I want to see the rest of the way of the offense, and, and I, you know, Jacoby Brissett can get tunnel vision. And it's been great that Peoples Jones, Najoku, and Cooper account for like 75% of the receiving yards. But what I'm hoping happens, and it wouldn't surprise me if Watson sort of comes in a little bit with tunnel vision, is that over the rest of the nine games, we start seeing more of Harrison Bryant. We see more or more contributions from Harrison Bryant, more contributions from a David Bell. I was surprised we didn't see more Harrison Bryant in the last game, to be honest with you. Yes. I fully expected him to be a bigger piece of the offense. And yeah, I, I'm with you about David Bell. Like I would like to see him be a bigger part of this offense. I mean, I'm pretty happy with Donovan people Jones and what, what he has contributed thus far. Um, and he's very reliable. I think we have Mm -hmm. to, we have to give him credit for that. Like he is shorthanded. He makes plays. He's someone that you can really count on, especially like within, within that position. Right. You know, this team is keeps letting it known that they love Michael Woods. He's healthy. Are we going to see him? You know, Anthony Schwartz. Anthony Schwartz, where's he been? Well, again, you go back to like the Patriots game. There's plays where Jacoby Brissett misses him wide open yeah, down the field. And and Deshaun Watson, it may take him a little bit to get there. He's not going to miss those. Now, will Schwartz catch it? That's the big question. But that's a <laughs> dynamic that changes. the. Th- so I'm just hoping we see a little bit more of an expanded look. And before I move on to the defense, the thing I would add is – Coming out of the trade deadline, we kept everybody, kept Kareem Hunt. And thinking about that, I think in addition to the fact that the Browns didn't get what they really wanted for him, 
I think it comes down to pass protection. The Browns, Jerome Ford is in the window, whether they activate him this week or not, he's sort of in the window to be activated. It wouldn't surprise me if they don't because they don't really need him and they just sort of like really having him practice and not having to actually use a roster spot on him. Those are the gymnastics get to play, but they've got Darren Johnson still. Um, so they've got like their stable of guys and yet they kept cream hunt. And I think that has everything to do with pass protection. And, and this is one of those things where like fans love to throw out the idea. Let's see what this looks like. Coaches don't operate that way. They can't. And especially when it comes to pass protection, I think part of the reason that, that he, uh, that hunt is still here is because they can trust him and Nick Chubb to pass block. And I think, the peace of mind they get from that relative to Deshaun Watson coming back is a factor in why that he's still here. It, you know, if we get into sort of this whole min max mindset of, you know, fifth round pick would be better than, than what we're going to get from Creed hunt. Maybe that ends up being true, but I think the Browns are saying to themselves, we'd rather have Deshaun Watson have the absolute best situation possible to maximize him if he gets rolling and they get that momentum heading into the next season, that's worth more than whatever they would would have gotten for Kareem Hunt or might get as a compensatory pick. Plus, I still don't rule out the fact that Kareem Hunt could be here next year. I think the fact that his base salary is the league minimum and nobody wanted him. I don't expect that free agent dollars are going to come his way and people are going to be, hey, come here, take $6 million again. I just don't think it's going to happen. I think he's going to get half or even less than that. And if that's the case, he may end up staying here because he does have a role in all of those things. So we'll see. Anyway, defensively, what have we learned so far? Because this is obviously the the group. There's a lot, a lot to take away from this one. And I think Deshaun Watson figures into that a little bit. Oh man, this is also a loaded question. Um, no, I I think what we talked about last week's episode is I think the defense has actually made some positive strides and some good steps forward, especially against some of the better quarterbacks within the league. Um, obviously, it's they've really been kind of ravaged with injuries too, um, which has has really you know changed the personnel who's on the field at the same time. I think we've seen some players have some ups and downs this entire season. Um, And that's not even just some of the younger players. That's also like John Johnson, who um, actually like wearing the green dot against the Bengals seem to seem to be a lot better. So I'm hoping that that's something that they can continue. Um, Obviously from a cornerback standpoint, MJ Emerson has been like really the bright spot in my opinion. Um, Speaking of a rookie, you, since I know you didn't see this pro football focus did a redraft of the first round. Yes. MJ Emerson is in the first round based on what he's done to this point. So awesome. Love to hear that. Well, and, and, and warranted, I think he's played yeah. really, really well in a secondary that was loaded with guys and has sort yes. of made greedy Williams sort of the, you know, bad seafood did not help, but he's sort of become a forgotten man between injury and bad seafood. Right. He could be a, a key <laughs> figure against bad uh, seafood. <laughs> well, that's, that was the excuse they gave during the broadcast. <laughs> It's just funny to like this poor guy (laughs) just sitting on the sideline and then they eventually put him in anyway um i think greedy williams could have a bigger role against the miami dolphins and their speed but the browns like mj emerson has allowed them to basically not look back at all and just like we're off and we're going we've got this other dude who stepped up anyway i'm sorry no i mean he's he's big he is physical which i also really like that he's he's... i love corners who are dicks (laughs) right i mean Honestly, th- that's what I feel like this team needs. Like you need some of those players. And it feels like we are always on the receiving end of playing against Dick cornerbacks. But like now we have one and it feels mm-hmm. great. So, um, you know, I love me Greg Newsom because he also is a really big Crocs lover. That's just a personal thing with us. Um, but, you know, I do think when you look at the secondary, I think coming into the season, we expected them to be a top five defense and, Overall, we had been pretty disappointed with how how things shook out in the first few games. But I do I do think that this team is actually starting to connect the dots. And I think the other big piece of that is Miles Garrett kind of playing back up to the level that we expected him to. And now obviously he had kind of a weird a weird start to his season with um, his accident and like not being 100 percent and like how that 
played through in the locker room. I don't know. It's been kind of a weird season for this defense. I think a lot of disappointment early on, a lot of injuries, the Miles Garrett incident, um, you know, and I'm hoping that they they kind of take the confidence that they had coming out of the game against the Bengals and they're able to capitalize on some of the things they do really well. I mean, this Miami offense that they're up against on Sunday is, I mean, that's going to be a really big test. But Pete, we talked about this, like, this team, this defense specifically, was built with speed, mm-hmm. right? So, like, we should actually match up. Um, this is where I do feel like Andrew Barry and staff has kind of put together this defense to go up against the likes of Lamar Jackson and yes. speedy receivers. I mean, this defense has changed so much over the last three years, but um, even even – you know, when you look at how they've played against Kansas City, like they were able to slow them down for the most part, mm-hmm. um, which I think is an important factor to keep in mind that I don't think we can write this defense off. And I think they will get better as we continue down the rest of this season. The last point you made is so critically important to what the Browns vision is. And people hate Joe Woods, right. whatever. Between him and Andrew Barry. They have their finger on the pulse of where the NFL is and where it's headed. Yep. You have to be able to match speed and take away the passing game and have your, give yourself a lot of options. You have to be able to rush the passer effectively. Um, and you have to be able to just have enough. And I will always default back to the Kansas City Chiefs Buffalo Bills playoff game. Yes. Neither defense had any speed up front that could put any pressure on either of those quarterbacks. They would roll out to the side set up a picnic, and then throw to whoever they wanted the <laughs> entire game. Both teams are just too slow. What do the the Browns have been doing? They have Miles Garrett, who's fast enough, Jadavian Clowney, who's fast enough. At the time, they had Tack McKinley, who's very fast. They draft Jeremiah Wusu Cormo, who's yep. very fast. Like, they are, they were thinking ahead of this in terms of what's going to stop. You know, everybody goes, oh, JOK's the Lamar stopper. And it has actually worked out that way, even though I, I thought that was like, a dangerous way to sort of categorize him. I thought that was sort of destined, putting him in a position to fail, <laughs> but he's also really good at dealing with these other things. It's like, you have to be able to put stress on Josh, on Patrick Mahomes, you know, Justin Herbert, Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow. I mean, yeah, Joe Burrow Lamar was Jackson. super uncomfortable when we saw what happened. You have to make them nervous. And you watch that. If, if you, you know, if you're a person who wants to go back and watch that playoff game, those guys were never stressed. In that right. game, because neither side had the ability to do that. So even though the defense is not where we want to be, where we want them to be, they are built in a way that portends success if they can add the necessary pieces. Now, the Deshaun stop Watson putting, wait, trade. Wait, wait. And also stop putting 12 men on the field. Let's maybe start there, too. Well, listen, any advantage we can get. <laughs> maybe we can sneak that. Maybe maybe once that we won't get caught. No, listen, if. Maybe that set the tone for for that game. 12 <laughs> men right off the bat, letting them know. It's like we have 12 men on the field all the time. I, you know, the, the Deshaun Watson opportunity presented itself, and I think it set the defense a year back. And I know most people are like, you can't do that. But the reality is they acquired Deshaun Watson, and they lost veterans. And we've talked about this. They lose Malcolm Smith, who's a very nice veteran to have. They lost Malik Jackson, who is a grown adult in a room in a in a, a defensive room that needed them. Troy Hill, I don't know if I'd categorize him as an adult, yeah, but he's been yeah. around a while. Uh they lose a lot of these glue, you know, glue guys, veterans, guys who understand what it takes. And unfortunately, we went through this stretch where one, I think getting Deshaun Watson and the and the the suspension probably took a little bit of wind out of their sails after a great su- what they believed was a great summer. They thought they were going to be in great shape. And I think they legitimately had to sort of figure some stuff out in terms of what it took to be professionals. And there are guys on this de- team, what, some of which had to figure some stuff out. So, like, I don't think Greg Newsom was a guy who wasn't preparing himself. I think Greg Newsom was a guy who took some bumps and bruises because he was, suddenly goes from being asked to play nothing but the boundary, uh, you know, outside corner last year suddenly being on oh by the way you're also going to play slot this year that's a lot on his plate and at one point I was asking the question did the Browns put too much on him this year to his credit I think in the last few weeks you know there are games where he was just getting beaten just 
beat in man coverage and some other stuff where he just looked really bad. I think in the past few weeks, he's really rallied and played a lot better in that standpoint. You mentioned MJ Emerson. Part of the reason I love MJ Emerson is he has limitless confidence. He does not care if you beat him. You're going to get him again. He's going to beat you up and he's going to make a play. And like, as you said, that's why I love prick corners. That's why you love those because they are there every play ready to go. And they're talking or whatever. And I do think that has an impact on the rest of the defense. I think you have to have that sort of alpha alpha dog. You don't have to have a room full of them, but you have to have a couple guys who set the tone and be like, okay, you got me this play. I'm going to be right back next play and you're going to have to beat me again. And I think that has helped Uh, Grant Delpit. I think he is a guy who probably needed, you know, needed a wake up call in terms of preparation. He has played a lot better the past couple of weeks. I think part of that is the Browns have done a better job putting him in position to succeed. Um, that has stabilized the position. I think he was very good against the Ravens. I think he was pretty good against the Bengals. Um, you mentioned John, John Johnson, who entertains me for the simple fact he so desperately wants to be a leader on this team so badly but has the worst timing on make, doing dumb things on the field. Just <laughs> absolute. If there's like, there's just, whether it was like that incredibly stupid personal foul penalty he draw, drew or some bad plays or in like a, in the running game and stuff, some of the stuff that he does, he just always finds himself the exact worst position possible to screw up. I do think he's a pretty good coverage option. I think he's, it's debatable if he's worth what they're paying for him, but uh, I think he's, probably better than he's given credit for um the denzel ward piece it's it it is what it is like he he's certainly not the first player who got a massive contract and came out sluggish um then you add in the concussion he's set to play this week that is good news he can he is again you look at the miami dolphins this week you look at the buffalo bills next week denzel ward is tailor-made for those type of teams that have yep. a ton of speed and can just say you're gonna have to cover us all day like that is why you have him on this team hopefully he bounces back he's not the only guy in this in fact the Dolphins have a corner in Xavier Howard who's having a Denzel Ward like season this year not what you want but hopefully they rally so you add in all those things on the secondary obviously losing Anthony Walker struggled uh caused some issues in the linebacker level Miles Garrett's accident I think had more than just a physical component I think there was a a, a, a psychological component in there but even with all that said he's playing as well as he's ever played in his career in terms of like advanced metrics and like you know how often he's double teamed and he's still winning at the highest rate of like any anybody um Jadavian Clowney's injury has sucked it just has um defensive tackle continues to be a nightmare but it has sort of worked out in the sense of Alex Wright has gotten a lot of reps and it's been rough, but he's starting to figure it out. You're seeing more of Isaiah Thomas who had a great game against the Bengals. I I, the, I, I would love to know what the Browns really thought going into the season about the defense. If they sort of projected some of this was going to happen and, they, and their thought process was like, obviously they didn't want it, them to play badly, but I'm wondering if somewhere in the back of their mind, they were sitting there going, well, this group needs to sort of find some leadership in the room and adversity might produce some of that. And it seems like maybe a guy like Sione Takitaki is suddenly becoming a mm-hmm. bigger presence in the locker room. And he's played really well in, in, in expanded opportunities. And, and suddenly people are talking about, you know, resigning him to, to take on a big role. I think they should resign him. I don't know what that will cost, but he's played well. Um, Deion Jones, you bring in an adult. I don't know how well he's playing, but he's at least in there and he's more functional than Jacob Phillips was. Unfortunately, Jacob Phillips suffered another season ending injury. His luck is horrific. I think we learned that the Browns were too young on defense for their own good. The hope is that through those six games of struggle, that they've sort of figured some things out, learned a lot them- about themselves, and that they can take the momentum they've created this pa- next this, those past two games and the bye week and be really confident against the Dolphins because if – You look at this, like, if the Browns defense was still playing like crap, I would be dreading this game. But the fact that the Browns are playing well on defense, I don't know if they'll win this game, but I'm excited to see them play this type of game. I want to see them have these type of tests. I'm not concerned about making the postseason. Certainly, I would would love them to win every game the rest of the year. But what I really want to see is them get better and continue to evolve on that defensive side of the ball and get 
earned confidence that says we are a great defense as opposed to, you know, I, I don't want to say it's fake, but just I was worried about what I was hearing in in the summer about the, about them talking about being a top five defense and all this, because one, I thought it was going to be harder than that, given some of the issues they had on like defensive tackle and stuff. But uh, don't get me wrong. They played well in some games last year. Obviously the Bengals game was great. They they did great against the Ravens uh, multiple times, but they didn't really have a game like the Miami Dolphins or the can't, you know, Buffalo Bills where they can go, Oh man, we really, you know, we really showed up. I think the Bengals game was certainly a big deal. Um, that was like a masterpiece type game, but just consistently delivering that type of performance. I, I, w- I want to see them get earned confidence the rest of the year. Yeah, that's a good goal to have. Okay. Coaching staff. We sort of hinted on some of the stuff we learned about Kevin Stefanski. I think play calling you and I are on the exact same page. He's great. Um, and I and I don't think he's alone. I, I will always say that's a cor- uh, collaborative process with Van Pelt and Bill Callahan. In fact, this week, Alex Van Pelt basically said that Bill Callahan's influence is why they have the eight man offensive line package. I love this. It's my uh, favorite. What what was it? Double. I'm still waiting for my big man touchdown. By the way, double muscle package I believe, is is the is the name they came up for it. Um, and and it's the uh the 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 double pump uh bicep thing to signal that in. Love but that. like for people who are like, oh, it's all Kevin Stefanski. Like this is where I'm telling you, it is not. It is a group effort. And Bill Callahan is part of this. Stump Mitchell is part of this. Chad O'Shea is part of this. Alex Van Pelt is part of this. And there are going to be times where Alex Van Pelt is calling plays. Um, and uh, and Kevin Stefanski simply relaying them into the game. So it's just how it works. But taking that aside, we both agree they're very good on that. I think the evidence speaks for itself. How about in terms of, well, one, the coaching staff as a whole, and then two, Kevin Stefanski and the, the rest of it? I'm honestly fine with where we're at. I know it's frustrating sometimes um, with Joe Woods and or the defense specifically, but like to be honest, Pete, like – I think seeing improvement with some missing pieces and or this defense not being having all the parts and being super young. You know, I actually think Joe Woods has done a pretty good job. I I don't I just don't want to throw in the towel and have to start over like really at anything. I actually would be okay if special teams if if we if we started over there um with Mike Prefer because he wasn't even a Kevin Stefanski hire I don't think I think he was inherited from he was pretty... but they did have a previous relationship from Minnesota because you know everything runs through Minnesota right 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 but yeah I I mean I just feel like good organizations good teams you don't see significant turnover Um, And I would like to see continuity on this staff. um, And I would like to see continuity going into next year, knowing that they're going to have, you know, the quarterback at the helm that they all wanted, which I do think makes a difference, even if he doesn't play defense. Um, I I would just like to see that consistency and continuity from the coaching staff. Um, As you mentioned, it's a very collaborative effort. Um, I do not think that there is any one person that is, dictating um, play calls or defensive calls or anything like that. I do think this staff is very collaborative um, within the entire organization. So um, I do think they take pride in that. All I hope and ask for is that there's really no ego or stubbornness involved in any decision that they make, whether that's a, a, a coaching position or even a player position, right? Like I, I did not think that this staff have ego at play, But, you know, sometimes I do question, you know, with their loyalty to players that they draft and or acquire, there does seem to be a specific hold over them. Oh, let's name names. Come on, let's go. I don't. Okay. Listen, I will say Andrew Berry signed Austin Hooper. He let him go. Mm -hmm. You know, there there have been specific instances, instances where that has happened, but specifically when it comes to players being drafted, we haven't necessarily seen them cutting the cord at this point in time. Um, who so, would you like us to, who would you like Andrew Barry to cut the cord on? I don't know. I don't know if I have an answer to that yet. Um, <laughs> he cut the cord on poor, uh, what's his face? Uh, the safety from Georgia. Oh yeah, yeah. I think I did see that, but wait, did he, did he end up back on the practice squad? Though? I don't think I mean, so. Okay. Uh, what was his name? Why am I blanking on his name? Oh man. 
I should know. This. I forget. Anyway, um, I think Andrew Barry inherited a lot of talent on this team, specifically the offense. Like he did inherit a lot of talent on this team. I think what stands to be questioned at this point is how his draft picks play out and the success of them in the near future. At this point, I, I don't think we have necessarily seen top level talent that he has specifically drafted. I think we have some wins. I don't know if we have players that other teams would be clamoring to get oh. um, if we were to let go of them. It was Richard LeCount. That is oh, that's right. That's right. Is that, that's the, sole, is that the sole draft pick? That he's released? That's hard. I'd have to look. Uh, you know, some of them are just injured, like Nick Harris, who was set to start. Yeah, well, um, Andrew Barry ten- has a tendency to draft players that get injured a lot. So <laughs> just, I'm just kidding. That's interesting because, like I said, we, we just talked about, you know, MJ Emerson. They're, they're yeah, I, I, I pick. think he's playing M- great. He is playing great. I And I think we've seen flashes from, like, even Greg Newsom last year. Like, we've seen flashes. I just want to see, like, consistent really good players that other teams would be happy to have. Like, all right. So, I don't know. I, I guess we're very, I'll, I'll, we're ask, very, I'll run we're down very a list biased, Pete. We're very no, biased. I understand. Like, well, here's what I'm curious about. So let's run down a list. Would team with other NFL teams be get in a line to go after JOK? I don't think so. Really? I don't think so. He wasn't even, he wasn't on anyone's draft board. I mean, think about that. Well, that was because of a heart condition that proved not to be true. I I don't know. I don't. I really don't think so. I don't think so because I don't think any other team really knew how to use him. Well, the Miami Dolphins do. They have a guy who's doing the exact same thing he is, and uh, Jerome Baker, the former Ohio State linebacker. He's six two, two twenty five. Does well, yeah? Thing. They don't need JOK. How many other teams <laughs> want a guy like that? So uh, that, I I would disagree. I think JOK would be a very hot commodity. Now I do grant there are teams that would not know how to use him and would wouldn't bother, but I think. Um, and he might not even be playing the same position, but I do think he'd be a hot commodity. I think James Hudson the third is a big time commodity. Uh, it's going to be the starter next year. Um, because I, there's just they're not going to resign Jack Conklin. Jedrick Wills, I think, is a big, bigger commodity than people want to believe he is. He's inconsistent in some way, he makes some dumb mistakes, but overall, he's still a very good tackle and he's young, and they're just there aren't you know, no team can have enough of them. So um, I think their linemen in particular are valuable. I think Nick Harris, he's very specific. They're, you know, like the, the Bengals are not signing Nick Harris. The Ravens are not signing Nick Harris. But there are teams that are more inclined to get a guy like Nick Harris that run that zone stuff. Donovan Peoples-Jones obviously would, will have a market. You know, Grant Delpit, I, I, I do think there's value with him. Obviously, he's got to continue playing well to, to maintain it. But I, I think, one... Part of the reason that there's this sense of that is what part of this becomes down to the fact we have we we have two camps. There are people who think Kareem Hunt is a top five running back, and there are people who think none of our players are any good because they're very worried they don't want to overrate them. And I understand being very excited. You know, I sort of understand both camps. I understand why people look at especially last year and go Greg Newsom and JOK this is like the new era of Browns defense it's gonna be great I still think that's ultimately gonna prove true and the flip side is I, I can sort of look at it this year and you go oh, JOK is not playing well he looks relatively average and all that Greg Newsom's still pretty solid you know we'll see where it goes but I'll give the ultimate example is Cameron Wembley 11 sacks as a rookie didn't do anything from there on out and I think that's part of that that fear is we we want to see those guys. And look, none of these guys yet is Nick Chubb. None of these guys is right. Miles Garrett. None of these guys right. is uh, Joel Batonio. Those are three guys. Two of those guys are going to end up in Canton and one might still before he's done in Nick Chubb. So I understand it from that standpoint. And the other part of that is quarterback is so critically important to the equation that it, it, sh- it, it colors everything else you do. And obviously with, Deshaun Watson's off field. It makes it very difficult to like him, even though he's you know supremely talented um, for what that is. But I think if the Browns are winning, which I think they would be doing more of if they had Watson out there, or, or the Browns roll with Watson the rest of this year, I think people are suddenly going to feel better about the roster than than maybe they did because I think there are a lot of people in your camp who are sitting there going, "Are we really that good?" Yeah, um, and I get it, but I do think. Andrew Barry does a nice job. He's obviously not going to hit everything, but like 
one, I, 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 I'm not even going to compare him to like John Dorsey and previous Browns teams because it was so bad. It was embarrassing. Like it wasn't professional quality, but I do think if you look at teams like the Baltimore Ravens right now, they wish they were drafting like Andrew Barry desperately because they are getting killed having to sign a million veterans because they're not getting enough out of their draft pick. Cincinnati Bengals are, are not getting enough out of their draft picks. Obviously Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase are great, 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 which covers up for a lot of those things, but it's interesting. So I was just curious on your perspective on that. As far as the coaching staff, Joe Woods is never going to be popular in Cleveland. Never. But he's a way better defensive coordinator than anyone wants to give him credit for. He's not above, uh, he's not beyond reproach. There are things you can criticize him on in terms of being predictable relative to fronts and some other things. But I do think he has the pulse of the NFL and where it's going. Could the Browns do better than Joe Woods? Probably. Are they going to do better than Joe Woods? I don't know the answer to that. And ultimately, that may be why I think he's far safer in his job than most people want, would like to admit. He's also been way better than people want to give him credit for, especially against the AFC North, where he's giving up like 18.2 points per game in the last nine games against the AFC North. And his worst opponent is the Steelers right now. He's been great against the Bengals. He's been great against the Ravens. I think people have to sort of, at whatever they want, you know, ultimately he has to own the product on the field. But I think people have to come to grips with the fact that a lot of the issues the, the Browns defense was facing were player based. And the people who are telling you that the players, they have consistently said it's on us. We're doing, we're not, we're not doing A, B, and C. We've got to do better at these things. And in the past two weeks, they're going, we're doing better at these things. Things are going great. And it's weird how defensive they continue to get when people raise questions. Like Sione Takitaki is another one. He's like defending Joe Woods and saying, look, you know, we've got his back, all this other stuff. We've just, you know, they give us good, good stuff. We've just got to be able to execute. So that's interesting. Mike Prefer, I, have, I, I struggle to find his appeal. I don't know what he does. You're sitting there going, yeah, Mike Prefer, let's go. Uh, I, you know, I, I, it's interesting that now he's starting to try to block more punts. I thought that was something that was way more prudent for the Browns to do because they can't return them. So why not try to block them all? I don't know why he doesn't take more touchbacks on kickoff returns because they're not good at returning. Right. Jerome Ford could help, but they're not good at those things. Like those are simple fixes where I philosophically have disagreed with Mike Prefer. That's beyond the the mistakes they make. The the fact that those units are continuously making losing plays for the Browns. I philosophically disagree with his approach, um, and that's ultimately why I think not during the season, but after the season. I hope the Browns explore getting another special teams coach. And it's, you know, one, obviously Mike Prefer has said some things that he shouldn't have in his past. That doesn't help. I, I would point out he's really good in a press conference. Like he's very good at talking to the media and answering questions. He's very positive about guys. But then I would quickly point out that some of those guys that he pumps up suck on the field and just <laughs> undermine all of his credibility. So, uh, you know, I, I like Joe Woods more than most. You know, I get crit people get very mad at me, although it's been very quiet on that front lately. I, I think Kevin Stefanski is great. I think people who want to dismiss him as just being an offensive coordinator are just it, it's a joke. The number one most important thing a, a head coach in the NFL can do is maximize the quarterback position. I, it, tell me any great coach in the NFL who hasn't. Bill Belichick, obviously Tom Brady for a million years, maximized the quarterback position. Marty Schottenheimer was a defensive guy, but whether it was Kozar here, Drew Brees in San Diego, or you know it, it, Joe Montana and, and other guys he had in Kansas City, he maximized the quarterback position. Like you have to be able to do those things to win. And like I left, I, I laughed. Uh, watching the Tennessee Titans game because there are so there are a number of Browns fans who like are way thirstier relative to Vrabel than women ever were to Stefanski and it's very weird because they're like oh he coaches such a tough team they play with a ton of effort and he does all those things he's a pretty good coach I'm not going to say he's not a good coach but the quarterback position is a question mark and yeah. like mm -hmm. you can only go so far doing that and Kevin Stefanski Whatever you want to say about him, he can go Baker Mayfield in 2020 was a top 10 quarterback and be right. He can look at this season and go, Jacoby Brissett might be a starter in the league next year because of me. Yeah, that's um, 
that is proving the point that Kevin Stefanski is a very good coach. So are there things that maybe he can get better at? Sure. Sure. I mean, look, and that's the other part is He's like still really young is that coaching is, like position. Which is, well, which is like the thing that we don't seem to ever account for that coaches get better and develop and because, it, you know, it, and it's tough because, you, you know, there's so much pressure or you're fired. Um, but these guys do develop over the course of time. Look, there's no better example. And obviously the Browns did not fire Bill Belichick, but Bill Belichick went from Cleveland and the Ravens to New England Patriots and everybody hated Belichick or whatever. And now he's the greatest coach, you know, in history. He figured some stuff out along the way, like let these guys do it. And for all the people who want to scapegoat guys, I would ask them, how's it going in Indianapolis? They've had the brownsiest two weeks oh, yeah. that have ever been brownsed uh, with everything going on there and Jim Ursay losing his damn mind on live television. If you know, if you start firing guys and you lose, then you have nowhere to go but to keep firing guys. And like, it's just not a good way to operate. And if you're trying to emulate a functional team, functional teams don't do this. And yes, you, occasionally you can point out like, there's been some guy that was fired somewhere like the Ravens offensive coordinator at some point it was replaced by another credible guy and they did better. Fine. The Browns don't have that. If you fire Joe Woods, your next man up is Jason Tarver. Most of you have to Google who Jason Tarver is. Jason Tarver is the linebackers coach. I think he does a really nice job there, but he was a terrible defensive coordinator for the Raiders in like 2010 to 2012. That's the most senior guy on the staff under Joe Woods. Now, I think there is a case to be made that perhaps, and I would say straight up, the offensive staff is way, 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 way better than the defensive staff. If you were mm -hmm. just lining them up, Bill Callahan, I mean, you could stop there and you go, I win. Yeah. But Chad O'Shea is a good coach as, as receivers and passing game coordinator. Stump Mitchell is a good coach with running backs. Like they've got a lot of good coaches on that staff. I question if the defensive staff is that good. So is there that a place where the Browns might look to sort of replace guys, shuffle some guys around, try to upgrade potentially. But my bigger issue right now is special teams. I, I just, like I said, I, I don't see the appeal with one Michael Prefer, despite his sterling playoff record. Yes, I would agree with that. Okay, so the Miami Dolphins this week. As I said, look, I I am not going into this. Look, well, let me ask you this. Coming into the season, what was your sort of best guess or prediction for how the what the bronze record would be at at the time Deshaun Watson came back? I thought we would be closer to even or slightly under. Really? You had you were way higher on them than I was. I thought this team was going to be four and seven. <laughs> I just, I, I could, I could see a scenario where the Browns won entire month of September and then lost every game after that. I thought or, five and six was possible. Sure. And it still yeah. is. Technically. I don't know. I don't know if I feel good about it, but yeah, <laughs> if I feel good about that either. It, yeah. It, uh, yeah. Five and six, five and six should have been possible, especially, Obviously, we didn't know that Jacoby was going to play this well, but um... well, look, and you, you, you come. Let's put aside what we thought could happen versus what sh maybe could have or should have yes. happened. Now that we know, yes. could have, should have happened. Yes, yes, this team should be at least two wins better. At least, yes. could I, be I mean, I actually me. thought, and we talked about this. I actually thought that it was going to be our defense that was really <laughs> yes. Serious. So that's why I thought five and six is possible because I was like, okay, well, our defense is going to be really good. We should be able to hold teams from scoring. And like, let's just hope the offense can squeak out some points to be able mm -hmm. to pull us ahead. Right. I was right there with you. Yeah. So like, like I said, I thought four and seven was pretty reasonable. I, for, and I thought it was going to play out the exact same reason the way you did. I thought the Browns defense is going to be good. I thought after that first month, it was going to be really difficult to find enough points to win games in October and November. Um, that has not been the case. Now, the offense is, there have been games where the offense has not done enough to win games. But nevertheless, I think it is, you know, whether it's you look at the, the Ravens, the Chargers, the Jets, there have been a number of games where it would not have taken much for the Browns to come away with a win. Obviously, the Jets is the easiest one to go. Well, you do one more thing right and you got another win. 
But I do think, one, I do think Tampa Bay looks very beatable right now. Obviously, that could change in a couple of weeks, but they're not very good. You know, that would put them at four and seven if they lose these next two. So I'm not overly concerned about the record. I never came into the season going, well, they got to make the playoffs because they told you straight up that wasn't really reasonable the second they traded for Deshaun Watson and then they signed, went with Jacoby Brissett. Whatever you say about Jacoby Brissett and how well he's played, and that's all true, the playoffs and the postseason, it was always going to be really tough. Now, it has been surprised the hell out of me that the Jets are in the mix for that, but right. um, the AFC playoff picture is very weird. But looking ahead to the Dolphins now, like I said, I – I'm excited to see this team play the Dolphins. The Dolphins are pretty good. They're not a great team, but they are a good team. They are very fast up front on defense. They just added Bradley Chubb to that defensive line. Like they have a ton of weapons on uh, at their disposal to attack the quarterback. Their secondary is okay. They're dealing with some injuries that has hurt them, but they've managed to to get by okay. Offensively, look, they've got the two fastest receivers in football who are on pace to set all kinds of records. But like you said, they are really fast on defense. Like this is a game where you get to sort of prove it. I think the Browns, if the Browns are, you know, even Bill Belichick said the first thing that stands out about the Browns defense, they're fast. I'm curious to see, can they answer the bell? Can they make this really competitive? And that doesn't mean they have to win, but I think we can delineate between good effort and poor effort. Even if, you know, they could win and play with a poor effort. I want to see them play with confidence and sort of match up like they believe they can win this game. If they play with that same confidence, that same intensity, that same speed, I think it will be a really fun game between the Miami Dolphins offense and the Browns defense. The flip side of that is I think the Dolphins front presents the most unique challenge that the Browns have faced this team, both mentally and physically. They've got the ability to play very big and they've got the ability to play smaller and faster and get after the quarterback. That is, which is not dissimilar to what the Jets could do, but the Dolphins just have more dudes. Um, it, you know, you go back and you say, what's the one game the Browns got sort of beat up up front. It was the Patriots. And you still sit there and go, how Daniel Quale plays for that team. Daniel Quale who played for the Browns, was a third-string backup for a while, is on that team and like was part of a unit that just beat the Browns up. It was just uncharacteristically bad. So I'm curious to see, can they do that? Can can Jacoby Reset play well against a defense that's going to blitz the crap out of him? Is he going to be able to make key decisions? Are the Browns going to be able to take advantage of their zone? You know, can they run the ball? I think this could be a big, big game for Nick Chubb. They're not a very good run defense, but again, it comes down to can you can you make the blocks necessary? So all of these things, both this game and the Bills, even if it's uh, Case Keenum playing in that game, which wouldn't hurt my feelings, but I kind of want to see Josh Allen um, just, again, to see them get the opportunity to you know, get that earned confidence that they beat a legitimate star quarterback, or in the case of the Dolphins, they beat the supremely gifted offense. Um, those are the things I want to see. And if, you know, if that means they're, they're four and seven, fine, obviously it'd be gr- better if they were, you know, five and six or, or, or six and five. But like I said, I, I'm less concerned about the record. I, I the, the wins and losses to me are more important for my own sanity because it just has a, t- it, what it does to everyone else, which then comes at me. Uh, but like in, just in terms of a development standpoint, I'm less concerned about wins and losses from a gauging where this team is truly at. I'm more interested in wins and losses from what it does for the team's confidence and what it does to sort of help the fan base get through it. Yeah, I think that would be something to look forward to is this team making a jump they haven't necessarily done before where you're beating teams, legitimate good teams that maybe you're not expected to win. I mean, that's that's what you see like well-coached, stable teams do that they come in and they still put up a really good fight. And sometimes it may not result in a victory, but in a lot of cases, it does. I mean, that's what I think about when I think about as annoying as they are and as much as we hate them, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Regardless of who is on that team, what quarterback they have, they always are in, typically, I'm going to say this year is not not going that well for them, but right. they typically always show up and put up a pretty good fight. And I think that's what I want to see from this team is, I think in order to turn the corner and be taken seriously, like we need to start, we need to start being consistent, 
and winning some games that we're not expected to win. Like show up and be mm-hmm. in the game the entire time. And the key to that is playing consistent defense. That's why the Steelers are able to do that. Defense yeah. travels. Defense tends to be more consistent than offense. The Steelers beat the Bills the first game of last year. Yeah. Improbably because of defense and special teams. They didn't do anything on yeah. offense yeah. in that game and they won. So if the Browns can carry this momentum over and play good defense, then all of a sudden they can be the team that does that and hangs around and 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 does just enough to win a game or, you know, maybe we produce another situation. We get another Bengals performance where, where a game that might have come down to the wire because the Browns were inconsistent both in, in defense and special teams and maybe their offense wasn't maximizing opportunities, that now it becomes a, a comfortable two and three score game where – you avoid those potential pitfalls like you had with the Jets. You avoid some of those those the, the, the losing you had against the Ravens and the Chargers. So ultimately, I think that is that is obviously going to be the key for this. If they can play good defense, if they can get that momentum going and continue to play that, then I think this team gets to be far more entertaining, far better quickly, and you know becomes an easier team to root for. Again, it's going to be interesting. They play. Six of their remaining nine games on the road. And then when Watson comes back, four of the remaining six. Weird way the schedule worked out. And unless they get flexed into a, another slot, which I don't think they will, it's not out of the question, but I still think the NFL is sort of like, yeah, we don't want to <laughs> mess with that. But nevertheless, all Sunday games, all out of the way, and they can just sort of humbly work and get better. That would be the best case scenario. So those of for those of you finding us on YouTube, subscribe with that. That's great. You know, the people subscribe to the podcast in, in, a, in a more traditional fashion. That's great. Tell a friend, especially if you're worried about uh, the imminent collapse of Twitter. I'm not, but enough people are. So subscribe if you're in that camp. Um, and hopefully you're going to hear outro music before this drops off today. <laughs> and then you won't have you, you will have a nice firm end to the podcast. Anyway, we will be back next week hopefully on tuesday and uh we'll talk about what happens